Brian, uh, awesome to meet you in person here. This is so awesome. Uh, and thanks for joining our, our podcast. Hey, no um, worries. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, this is great. Um, I, you know, first question, uh, I saw that, uh, your first job was driving a tractor. Is that right? It was. Yeah. I had, um, we, we grew up in the country north of Oakville, a little town called Norville. And, uh, yeah, directly behind our house, there was a, a few hundred acres on a farm. And, and my, uh, my first job, I think I was nine or 10. And, uh, the farmer would put me on this, <clears throat> on this giant tractor and tell me to, you know, it was already moving. And he'd tell me to point for the bales and the older kids would grab the bales and, and pile them up on the, uh, on the trailer. And every now and then they wouldn't get one fast enough, but I'd run over. <laughs> that was good fun. I feel like, uh, many people learn to drive a tractor at about 10. That seems like the average age. Yeah. The good old days, you know, when they, you, you could just throw a 10 year old on a, on a <laughs> 150 horse tractor and see what happened. <laughs> Well, that was a real tractor you were driving. That wasn't uh, a little forty horsepower or something. No, it was a big. It was a big tractor. Yeah, it was a big. I think I had to get lifted up. Um, <laughs> wow! It was a, a big old rusty John Deere, and uh, no, it was it was great. Good memories. So, uh, wh what did that teach you um, about uh, you know construction and uh, farming? Did it kind of change your life at all uh, being involved in that that early? You know, it's interesting. I, I grew up. You know, my dad's a blue collar guy. He, he owned a sheet metal shop at the airport and, and, uh, you know, we had yep. machinery and working at the farm and, and, uh, you know, I went to summer camp at a, a horse camp where they, you know, it was the tractors and excavators and, and toys. And I, I just grew up with right. a love of machinery. You know, I was, I was the kid in the, in the backyard at the beginning of winter when the snowmobile wouldn't start and I wouldn't give up <laughs> till I, till I got it running. Um, so just, I've always had a love of everything. Uh, mechanical and all, I always say, you know, if, if, uh, if life hadn't gone the direction it went, I, I would have been quite happy as, as a heavy equipment operator, um, right. I've got friends that do some mining up, uh, you know, West and up North. And th there's that to me, that would be a vacation for the while. Just go up there and, and dig and move some dirt and have some fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just like some gold mining or something like that. That'd be awesome. Yeah. We, we went up to the Yukon to visit, uh, visit some friends at a gold mine and, uh, yeah, we really heard around and took the side by sides out for a rip and, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I'm sure, you know, 60 hours a week for 15 years, it, uh, it might not be as much of a vacation, but uh, for me, that's fun. Right. Might get old after 15 years. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I see you, you started a handyman company when you were 14. Is that right? I did. Yeah. With, uh, with a friend of mine up uh, at our, our cottage on Georgian Bay, we, we had a little tin boat and nine, nine, and that was kind of our way to get gas money and treats and ice cream and what have you. And we started hauling garbage, uh, mowing lawns, things like that. And then uh, a couple of contractors and framing, um, you know, framing companies up there had us you know, bring them lumber and then it was carry the lumber and then measure that, cut it. And uh, before wow. we knew it, it was get up on the roof and cut me a valley jack and, and bang in some nails. So we, we kind of, you know, we eased into our apprenticeship hours that way. And it was, it was great. It, right. it had a little bit of everything. It had the boats, it had the equipment, the machinery, the tools, uh, and we were making some money and having fun. Um, have you always been entrepreneurial? Was that your first one or is there a lemonade stand in there somewhere? Um, I don't, I don't think I ever did. We lived in the country, so a lemonade stand, you know, the lemonade would get warm <laughs> yeah. before anyone drove by. Um, but growing up, you know, with with uh, my my dad having his company and my mom taking care of the books, you know, it it uh, getting a getting a job was was not really something I, I grew up with. It was, you know, you create your job, you you make the job, um, you know, and if you don't work, you don't eat that that was uh that was the lesson so i don't i don't think right. uh, a lifelong uh job as an employee was ever in the cards for me so this uh um this handyman uh business was this like out in the islands was it were you on the mainland for the most part or when you were saying you were hauling garbage i was kind of picturing this coming from like island cottages yeah it's the thirty thousand islands area up uh you know we were in uh, the moon river area mac tier woods bay beautiful uh, that opened up into san Susi, and so uh you know if you had a if you had a boat and a strong back there was always work <laughs> awesome um <clears throat> so it <laughs> Did that have anything? It sounds like islands are like a huge part of your life uh, now and then. And uh, yeah, yeah, always <laughs> growing like up, a segue. Um, 
on the water, you know, and, and my dad was a sailor. So we spent time on the boats and that's kind of how we started exploring down in uh, Florida and the Bahamas as well. And uh, Georgian Bay is one of those places growing up, you know, you're, you're at a, a, as a teenager, you're at a party, you know, half an hour away, you know, through a maze of islands. And it was, uh, yeah, that was always, uh, it was always a lot of fun. It was always comfortable. And yeah, I, I have a, I have a thing for islands and water, I suppose. <laughs> Definitely some, uh, logistical challenges, uh, working around water and, you know, up North and, uh, Georgian Bay area, I can imagine. Yeah. Barging everything in. It's a lot of manual labor. Um, you know, yeah. we built our, our, uh, lake house, our cottage up there as well. And, and, uh, you know, it was a lot of machinery getting things off the barge and up the hill and building roads and, and that kind of thing. So, I mean, it, it, it really was a, a playground um, right. you know, at work and play. Yeah. A fun thing to be doing when you're 14. Yes. Uh, so then uh, you went to school and, and got a law degree. Is that right? No, I, uh, I went to Western. I did uh, po- a degree in political science, believe it or not. Uh, oh, really? Started, wow. Started my, uh, my road down business. And then I, I took, some, uh, took a year off after university. And that was the idea to get to law school. But uh, it was right. in that year I, I actually got back into doing some renovations um, and building. Yeah. And, and, you know, that, that's when I just decided I, I, I can't sit at a desk. I can't. Uh, I mean, the whole idea as a teenager was, you know, your, your um, guidance counselor asks you what you want to do for a living. And, and my first thought was, well, my dad's lawyer has got a nice car and I want to have a nice car. So I should be a lawyer. Right. Um, and you, you put that together with, you know, eight years at Appleby College wearing a suit and tie to work every day. And, <laughs> You know, it's not really a, a school that uh, that promotes the traits. That it's not the first thing. Taught right. about. But growing up with a self-employed blue-collar dad, you know, I always wanted to jump out the window and work with the maintenance guys uh, doing work around the school, and uh, that that's what drew me back. And that that's when I kind of changed course. I went back to George Brown and took some courses there, and and that was it. Uh, I never looked back. I. Uh... <clears throat> I went to school for landscape architecture, uh, was coming out of school, um, you know, had done all these co-ops in, in the trades, building, you know, uh, landscapes and, mm. you know, uh, all kinds of different stuff came out and realized that, uh, I hated AutoCAD and I was right. like, I got to get back into the trades, you know, uh, something tangible, I think is what I was always searching for. You know, I, I, I would go to the shop with my dad and watch him take sheets of, of aluminum and, and punch holes in them and cut them and, and form them into something. And at the end of the day or, or however long it took, there was something tangible to look at and touch and feel and say, you know, I did that versus, you know, sending emails. And, and there's, you know, if people enjoy that, uh, it's great. We need, sure. we need emails sent as well. But uh, the less emails I send and the more tangible things I build or the more dirt I move, uh, you know, the more fulfilled I feel. I haven't had a, a lot of jobs, but uh, one of them I was working at a grocery store, and I used to say that this job would be amazing if you could see all the bags that I packed by the end of the day. No one kidding. giant ma- uh, uh, mountain or all the carts, right? But they all just left out the door. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't see anything. It was less uh, less tangible. I remember the day for me actually it was one summer. I saw an ad for one of those um, those college painters. And they yeah, were looking for yeah. people in our area to work. And I thought, well, that, I, you know, I can paint, I can do that. And I went to the first meeting and, and, you know, whoever owned the franchise or whatever was explained, okay, you guys are going to go out and knock on a thousand doors and any jobs you get, I'll pay you 10 bucks an hour. And, uh, yep. and that'll be it. And I left the meeting and I drove home and decided that that's insane. Why, why am I going to do the sale, do the work? Uh, and you're going to get the money. And that was one more thing that reinforced to me that, you know, self-employment's the way to go. So now you have 17 businesses in four different countries? I think 17 or 18 at this point. Yeah, there's a few. Wow. Uh, so how many how many years has that been uh, to get 17 businesses going? That are they is all construction? Been, what am I now, 39? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> uh, that has been... That's been about 25 years now. I mean, from the first uh-huh. legitimate, you know, our, our handyman company in the summers, um, you know, I don't, I don't think we filed a lot of paperwork on that one. And, and uh, you know, that was our, that was our business card company or, or I guess our, our, our gimme as far as the CRA be concerned. Um, right. you know, that was our lemonade stand, put it that way. That was it. Um, we found it. 
<laughs> yes, exactly. But that, that was, uh, yeah, it's been about 25 years since the, uh, the first company on my own was started. Um, you know, I, I dabbled in between university and, um, deciding not to go to law school and going back to uh, trade school. I, I dabbled in, uh, I opened a couple of companies doing air cargo brokerage. We brokered, uh, you know, freighters sure. and, and jets across, um, out West. And, you know, I had a, a I had a part-time job loading airplanes and, and doing things in Vancouver. Um, but it was always that drawback to the tools, hands-on, you know, getting dirty that, that brought me back. Um, you've probably met all kinds of great people in the trades. Um, are there any, uh, common characteristics of, uh, you know, people that are about to be real successful in the, in, in business? There are, I think, um, it's interesting. You, you hear a lot that there's a stigma around the trades, you know, if you, if you yep. fail at everything else, it's a fallback. And, uh, ironically, you know, I, I speak to a lot of, uh, high school kids about, uh, you know, getting into the trades and opening it up and, and changing the mindset that it's, it's not a fallback. It, it is a business. I mean, Peter Gilgan, uh, Madame Holmes, yep. tr- trades guy, you know, multi-billionaire, right. uh, he, he's in the trades. He's a contractor when you break it all down. So there are so many different parts of the industry that you can get involved in, um, that it's, it, it's, it's a great way to go. It's a business. And one thing I'm seeing, uh, not even lately, I mean, for the past 10, 15 years, and, and I, I guess I'm, I'm one of those people when I started, uh, you've got highly educated, highly motivated people that, that are getting into the trades that have a business sense as well. Uh, and mm-hmm. a lot of our younger employees, they tell me, you know, eventually I want to work for myself. I say, that's great. You know, let me, let me work for me. You'll learn things, train, but take a yep. business course a night, learn how to, how to sell, learn how to manage the money, learn how to do the accounting, do the sales, do your, your, your targets and your budgeting, learn how to pay your taxes properly so you can sleep at night. Because, you know, we've also had employees that were self-employed, but didn't know how to run the business. And you can yep. be the best tradesman in the world. You can be a skilled craftsman. And if you can't figure out how to, <clears throat> how to pay yourself, pay your taxes, and put put a, a little away for a rainy day, you're not going to be in business very long. You'll be back to being right. an employee. Uh, and there, there is value in that as well, in, in the trades or any other business. There's a lot of value in going home at 5 o'clock on a Friday night and not having to worry about it until Monday morning. Uh, that's yep. worth, I mean, it's worth a lot of money. Um, sure. So you have to decide, you know, do I, do I want to put those years in of, of 10, 12 hour days, seven days a week, uh, you know, and, and build that business and grow it? Or am I happy to do my trade, you know, working for someone else, being an employee and, and, and being able to do what I want at night and on weekends and, and live within my means that way. And there's nothing wrong with that either. Uh, you just have to decide which course you want to go when you get started, but it's an incredibly viable job. It's entrepreneurial. I mean, you can, you can take it as far as you want to go. And, and that one trait that I'm seeing is, is, is young, highly motivated and educated um, men and women that, that, you know, want to be entrepreneurs, but also want to play with, with tools and machinery and, and have fun and do something tangible. We're, uh, we're absolutely obsessed here about talking about these, you know, great people that are just so awesome at their craft. Um, mm. When you you got me thinking about, you know, the education system and, um, you know, I wonder, is there, is there a spot here? Like, should we be spending more time in high school, um, you know, teaching these people, uh, people like ourselves, uh, a little bit more about business. And, uh, I I feel like we teach, uh, there's a lot of training out there to master the craft itself. Uh, but actually, you know, as you said, how are you going to pay your team? How do you pay your taxes? You know, sign up for CRA, you know, you just, uh, I'm I'm already working on business 19. Uh, (laughs) yeah. Wow. Cause I, I think, I think the education system is broken. Um, yeah. you know, it's, kids get out of school, myself included, no idea how to pay your taxes, no idea how to budget, uh, can't make themselves breakfast, don't know how to do laundry, can't build anything, change a tire, uh, you know, anything. The skills that kids learn in school, they certainly need. They definitely need that stuff. You know, it, it teaches them how to learn more importantly than teaching them specific things. I, I have four kids right now, 10, 12, 16, and, and uh, 18. And, um, right. You know, our 18 year old's a 100% student, but he says, this is stupid. Why do I have to learn this stuff? And I say, because it teaches you how to learn. Uh, yep. Our younger kids have spent time with us on the island, involved in the business and filming. 
Uh, and they're so far ahead of their peers in school because they've had those experiences. They witness it. We teach them. I think right. that, you know, conventional, the conventional education system, as great as teachers are and as caring as they are, is, yep. is horribly broken. And I think it's, it's the, the person steering the ship. I think we have to focus more on skills. I think we have to focus more on life skills. Uh, you know, teach a kid that a dollar is not a dollar. A dollar is 40 yep. cents less all the taxes you're going to pay. Uh, you know, the money you put in your pocket, you have to, you have to save a portion of that for a rainy day. You have to pay yourself a portion of that. You have to invest a portion of that and really teach entrepreneurial skills because it is small and medium business to drive the economy, uh, you know, of, of any country. Um, and kids coming out of school really have, have, I mean, a lot of the skill they have is like, you know, go and grab a beer and, and listen to some music and enjoy yourself for a few years at college or, uh, or university. So I think if we start involving them hands-on and teaching them these things younger, uh, they have the capacity to absorb it, not all at the same time and at the same speed. Uh, but then they are also exposed to different things that, that they may pique their interest and that's where they really put their effort into. But I think all those basic skills and life skills are really important to put in the kids. Yeah, I I love hearing you speak about that. I couldn't agree more. I feel like that should be uh, that should be brought in in early to mid uh, elementary school, not even yeah. high school, let alone we might college. Be, we might be working on a school idea. Oh man, I can't wait to learn more. Oh that, man, that sounds yeah, so cool. <laughs> in my spare time. <laughs> yeah, any uh, any tips uh, um, with that idea on how to uh, uh, teach work ethic? <laughs> well. You know, I, I, I do actually. And to be honest, yeah. all of our kids understand that you get out what you put in. And, and there's other yeah. factors. There's certainly there's luck, there's bad luck, there's there's timing, there's all of that. You know, there's a circle of friends you keep, there's people that you meet, there's all of that. Um, but I think I think what a lot of people do is try and guide their, their kids in a certain direction, try and teach them something that they want to teach them. And our strategy with our kids has really been to to not do that so much, it's remove the barriers, remove any barriers so the kids can wander around, explore the world, see what it is, get into the machinery, whatever it may be, um, and just find what they're excited about. Um, but the work ethic thing, you know, I, I think, and I've, I've posted a few times about it online and the response I get is amazing. Animals. And believe it or not, we did a renovation for the, um, for the kindness club at the SPCA, the Humane Society in Oakville years ago. And the director of, of that uh, organization at the time said to me, uh, or I said to her, I said, this is great. The kids come in they're you know, they take care of the animals. It's kindness and it's great. And she said, you know, we're not about the animals. We're about teaching people how to treat and care for animals. And what they get in return is a better understanding of people. And it's about right. how to treat people. So that experience, and you know, our kids have had chickens and ducks and all kinds of things. And I made a joke one time that, you know, a chicken coop is great for a kid because it teaches them you put some work in, you feed something, you care for something, uh, you, you, you're you patient, you know, you have to wait from the time they hatch from chicks until they're six or seven months old till they start laying eggs. And I said, mm -hmm. eventually, they, you know, something comes out of their butt that, that you can eat. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about, it's about teaching them, you know, um, fishing and farming. And those were the two yeah. things that that my dad kind of, you know, instilled in me. Um, I have friends that, you know, I'd go fishing with and they throw one cast and they say, oh, there's no fish here and let's go home. And another right. friend will come back at the end of the day with a boat full of fish, you know, 12, 14 hours later. And they'll say, oh, yeah. that guy's lucky. He's not lucky. <laughs> he was out there for 14 hours casting every inch of every shoreline until he had a boat full of fish. And the, um, mm. the farming metaphor is interesting. Um, because these are salt of the earth things that I think tradespeople connect with. Uh, yep. The farming thing, you know, kids kids today come out of school and they're handed a bag of seeds. You know, we'll give you a down yep. payment for your house, a credit card, whatever it may be. And a lot of them eat the bag. That's it. Because yep. they're not willing sure. to do what farmers do. And farmers will go hungry for seven or eight or nine months. They'll get up at five o'clock in the morning. They'll take care of the soil. They'll take care of the seeds and water and pick the weeds and what have you. And eventually... They have this huge harvest. They get 10 times as many seeds. They've got all the food you can eat. Uh, you know, and the, the kids that ate their seeds look at them and say, wow, you must be nice. Um, but they put the time in. They, they, they put in the sacrifice. Yeah. 
And the, the message in that is you, you put in the work, you, you make some sacrifices and something comes of that, something positive comes of that, uh, you know, that, that now you're, now you're rolling in it. You got, you know, the fridge is full and, and you've got money and you've got seeds to sell and all kinds of things. So I think, you know, if kids really learn how to fish and farm, metaphorically yep. speaking, that's what's going to instill that work ethic in them. And I don't think we have that today. I think we have TikTok, saw what that girl did with the music and do it, copy it. Um, you know, and the kids are into that a little bit. We try and dissuade them, but what are you going to do? <laughs> they have to be kids at, at the same time. But I love your story about the, the chickens. We So we have chickens and mm. we, uh, um, my eight-year-old, we got her to start a, a business. So she started her first business and she's selling the eggs from her five chickens. And Beautiful. You know, I felt like, you know, so many things to teach there, right? Like yeah. marketing and uh, sales and customer service, you know, I have to you talk to her every single week. Started, charge her some interest. So she <laughs> yeah, there's Those a lot of jokes about that. <laughs> farm around the corner and, and uh, they, they just all started producing. So she's, she's uh, bought the cartons and she's selling the eggs around the neighborhood and uh, Lincoln's working on a clothing line, uh, you know, with oh, cool. branded thing. And so all, all the kids are kind of into that. Um, they've got that entrepreneurial spirit, which is great. Yeah. I love that. They're, uh, they're definitely uh, picking it up from you. That's for sure. So Brian, how did you make the transition over to Island of Brian? Uh, how, how do you go from, uh, um, you know, being out in the islands at 14 and, you know, doing uh, all the handyman jobs to, you know, now you're, uh, um, here you are uh, with this great uh, show. How did I end up there? Yeah. How, did, uh, how do you make that transition? And again, you know, when I think when, when kids are growing up and they learn things, you know, that they're, they're going to learn a skill, whatever it may be. Um, but you have to go beyond that. You have to learn how to run the business around the skill. And part of that is marketing. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I had my feet up watching HGTV as a young contractor I had uh, six employees at the time and I'm watching these guys, you know, plumbers, electricians, HVAC, and and the host is pointing at them saying, you know, if you need work done, these are the only guys that can do it. They're amazing at what they do. They, you know, there's their name on the screen. And I thought that is marketing genius. Uh, (laughs) I actually reached out to a a production company and uh, decided to quadruple my marketing budget that year. And I, and I, I offered three months of free labor with my entire company in exchange for some advertising. Uh, it all got twisted around and what have you. And all of a sudden uh, I was sitting in an office and, uh, uh, you know, looking at the head of content for the Alliance Atlantis at the time, she said, how would you like to have your own show? No way. And I looked at her and I said, so you're, you're going to give me jobs to do. You're going to pay me to do them. You're going to edit them to make me look perfect. <clears throat> and you're going to broadcast this to my target audience. He said, where do I yeah. sign up? Uh, yeah. And I'll tell you, it, it wasn't profitable the first three years. I could barely pay my mortgage. I could barely put food in the truck or feed the kids. Um, but I had a plan. It was I was I was farming. I said, let's put in our time, build something here, get the marketing. And then, you know, when I have the time, I'll, I'll take advantage of that and grow the businesses and go from there. So that, uh, yeah, it's a long sorted story, but it, it all started with a cast. That was it. All right. Um, love this story, Brian. Years ago, I I was on on a, on a TV show um, in the background working on something called uh, One Garden Two Looks. It was HD TV as well. Okay, um, and we used to joke about this all the time, or we still joke about it. But coming from construction you know, you kind of know how to build stuff and, you know, sometimes it's not all that easy and yeah. <laughs> sometimes you have to do it two or three times, four or five times, you know, to, uh-huh. to get it on TV. And we joke about how it's good TV, but do you, uh, do you run into those things, uh, every once in a while? I do. And the, uh, you know, the hard thing is construction and production are, are two very, uh, vicious animals that don't live well in a cage together. Uh, yeah. trying to trying to film a reno um is not easy uh you know the production crew gets in the way you have like you say you have to do it two or three times you have to make progress they're they're costing more money uh than we are on site so they they don't want to be there to watch drywall compound dry and they don't they don't want to watch paint dry uh they right. want to see these uh you know almost like a food show they want to see the make the dough stick it in the oven right. and pull the, the completed thing out of the other side so it's, you know, HGTV is really not designed as a how-to step-by-step. We'll show you everything. Uh, it yeah. really is a entertainment and, and 
uh, motivation and inspirational uh, thing about, look, look how ugly this room is. Uh, here's a great story in the middle and look at this amazing, uh, you know, result. So uh, it's television. You can't take it at face value for, for schedules or budgets or anything. And, and I think, uh, you know, any educated clients will know that. There's certainly a component of the industry that says, oh, all these, these shows are making life so hard for the contractor. And, um, but, you know, in, in truth, uh, you have to educate your clients. You have to educate yourself. Sure. And, uh, you know, that, that HGTV effect that's been written about it, that as the ratings on the network grew, so did right. spending on residential renovations, you know, exponentially increased. So it's been an incredible benefit, I think, for all of us in the trades that people are excited about their homes. They see a new kitchen, they want a new kitchen. Uh, sure, they right. might say, well, you know, Brian did it in half an hour for, for 10 grand. Um, but that might have been 20 years ago and, and uh, you know, in a different country. So, um, you know, that stuff doesn't relate, but certainly the inspiration is there. And, and uh, that's what you have to look for. Yeah, I think uh, what I'm, what I'm uh, you know, getting at, I'm just thinking about the funniest thing that ever happened to me is I was, we had to dig a hole by hand because there wasn't any equipment on the site. Oh. We planted a, a tree that uh, was like 175 caliper uh, uh, maple. You know, those things have to weigh 600 pounds, drop That's it in the hole. And then, <laughs> and then the, uh, um, the cameraman asked us to pull it and place it in again. <laughs> that was the, the one time where we were like, we just can't do it. It's literally yeah, impossible. It's, it's frustrating sometimes for sure. But uh <clears throat> yeah, you definitely have to you, you have to put yourself in the mind space that like we're creating entertainment and inspiration for other people. Uh, right. Maybe they need another shot at this, but uh, yeah, it, it, it gets frustrating, one hundred percent. So, any other uh, you know challenges with working on the islands? Like, I, I've I mean, always wondered what it's like. It, logistics were really tough. Uh, expenses, you know, we we had to fly everything in or bring everything in on a ship. Uh, right. some pretty hefty import duties. Uh, there's no right. taxes. You know, everyone says, oh, there's no taxes in the island, but they certainly make up for it with fees and import duties and what have you. Um, the you know, local labor force uh, was challenging. Yep. We, um, one, of the, one of the great things that, that we did and decided to do from day one, you know, I said, I don't want to bring in um, 50 expats to do this job. Uh, we're mm -hmm. renovating a hotel on an island in the Bahamas. It, you know, it, it, it was uh, next to the original prime minister's home, Lyndon Pinling, who, who created the country. And I said, you know, it only makes sense to hire people from the island, local people, bring some of our trades down from Canada to work with them and train them um, and, and, and then keep a local workforce there. So that was amazing to, you know, get we got work permits for some of our crews to come down and work side by awesome. side with some of the some of the locals um and you know some incredible friendships were made uh you know both sides were exposed to a different culture and, and had a lot of fun getting to know each other and um yeah it was an amazing time and it's 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 great for us to go there now and see that there's this local workforce that that has the skills in this building and they're teaching the younger ones as well and it's uh it's just great but challenge wise yeah workforce um you know availability of skilled labor uh, costs, the heat, the first yep. few months we were there, we didn't have air conditioning and it was north of 40 degrees and, and, and Whoa. humid. So that was a, that was a learning curve as well. So how, how do you get equipment out there? I know you, you've rented from, uh, from Dozer, uh, in yep. Florida, which is awesome. Thank you. But how, how do you get equipment out on the Island? How do you handle that? So we've got a ship that leaves Miami twice a month and it's uh, yep. it's a big barge with a, with a, uh, kind of a bow, ramp that that comes down and they uh they they supply the bahamian islands so anything we need to get over the island we load on the barge uh we ship no over uh if it's if it's something we've rented or equipment that we don't need long term we use it back on the barge yep. back over to florida and even wow. if it's on the island for four or five months it, it yep. might look like it's been there for 10 years because the salt in the air <laughs> uh the humidity Great. the sand the abrasion uh you know things age really fast over there so maintenance is super important um, Interesting. You know, making sure that that anti corrosion is is uh, applied all the time. Uh, anything right. that hits any salt water sits near the ocean corrodes so fast uh, that yeah. you have to be really proactive on maintenance. How long of a boat ride is that? Oh, geez, I think they're I think they're fourteen or eighteen hours out of Miami to get over there. It's a big wow. 
I mean, you're crossing the Gulf, the Gulf Stream, the Gulf of Mexico, which, wow. uh, which also, you know, I've crossed myself. Um, I don't know how many times now. Uh, if you have a north wind in a current that's moving north, uh, you know, a, a current opposing wind, the yep. uh, wave size doubles or triples immediately at the edge of that current. So, wow. I mean, we've had some surprises. And, and there's certainly times when, uh, you know, weather has has stepped in and said, your boat's not coming this week. Uh, so we've right. had to had to make do. Any other uh, major challenges working on the islands, hurricanes, um, any other? Weather? I mean, the pandemic was a big one. Um, yeah. We opened the hotel and a week later, you know, the world shut down. Uh, that was a that was a challenge just at, for the business to survive through. Um, yeah, we did have, we had we had Hurricane Isaiah go directly over the island. That was a Cat One uh, that didn't didn't cause a lot of damage for us, uh, but it was chaos. It was you know get all the shutters up, or, you know put everything away, and then they can fly around. Had to be battened down or put inside. Uh, Dory and the big Cat Five that that hit Abaco, you know, thankfully missed us. But, uh, but affected a lot of our staff, uh, their families and, and friends and what have you on other islands. So that, uh, you know, we certainly backed off the project a little bit and focused on, on trying to help where we could there. Um, but, I mean, you, you get – there's Bahamian boas that we would find in buildings and, and different really? uh, animals and crabs and uh, scorpions and all kinds of stuff. So, it, uh, yeah, it was, it was just learning to work in a different environment. Um, and we, we would have, you know, some of our, our local employees would come to work in pants and long sleeve shirts and a toque and all kinds of stuff in, in the middle of summer. <laughs> and we're, right. we're struggling to survive in shorts and a T-shirt. Um, yeah. And they're working hard all day, you know, barely breaking a sweat. And, you know, we can hardly handle it in the beginning. It, it takes a while to kind of acclimatize yourself. So that was uh, – and the distractions were, were – uh, were a challenge as well. You got the ocean right there. You've got diving yeah. and fishing and all kinds of fun stuff to do. So you had to focus on the job for sure. What? Why were the locals wearing you know long sleeves and long pants? Is it you know sun protection? Uh, and, and sun you, know, pr- yeah. you learn after a while in that heat. It, it's mostly the sun that heats you up. Even if it's a a, a blistering hot humid day, uh, when you cover yeah. up, it actually keeps you cooler. Uh, so it was it was it was interesting. And and they're you know they're used to that heat. They're used to working in that heat and putting in the hours. And and uh, we just we'd have guys show up in jackets in the morning. We're already in you know want to take our, our soaking wet sweaty t shirts off. Yeah, right. it was great. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you: Do people suggest you know different shows and ideas to you, or or is there a show that you had an idea for that you know hasn't yet come out? Uh, we've got, I mean, we've always got things in the works. We've had shows we've been developing and pitching, you know, for the past 15, 20 years. Um, yeah. It's interesting. We've had shows come out and we get, we get ideas and pitches all the time. Uh, I mean, yep. all the time. I, I couldn't even, I couldn't even venture a guess at how many. Um, <clears throat> and every now and then, because there, there are, you know, there are almost no ideas left that are, that are completely, uh, or that someone else hasn't, hasn't thought of already. So we've right. pitched shows, actually gone into production, and when that show hits the air, someone says, "I, you know, I told you last year you should." Oh yeah. And uh, the irony is, a lot of these things you 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 develop a show idea and you think about it, it's two or three years until you're filming that show. You know, we've already right. got uh, the next season for the next couple of years and other shows in development. So from idea to actually watching it on television, you could be two to three, four years. Yeah, so you're not pitching and starting next week. No, we don't. It's it's kind of the same as building a custom home. You know, you don't just get up on Monday and decide this week we're going to start a custom. Uh, It's it's a it's a bit of a process to get things going. So, having worked in the Bahamas and you know up in Canada, what what do you prefer weather wise? Do you prefer to work in the cold or the the real hot? You know, I used to I used to think the cold uh, because you could layer up. Uh, You know, as you get warm, you could unlayer. One thing we did learn in the Bahamas, when you, you know, those hot, humid days in Ontario, I mean, we, we get them. Uh, yep. And it, it just feels like you're in, you know, a humid rainforest or whatever. You're sweating away and it's really uncomfortable. Uh, yep. It's hard to cool down versus put a jacket on. 
But there's a point, you know, that came and, and we all kind of noticed this on the island when you just accept it. I am going right. to be sweaty and disgusting and I'm going <laughs> to smell and it's going to suck and my shirt's going to be soaked all day. When you accept that, yep. you don't really notice the heat as much, which is interesting. Right. And I think it's the same when you just accept the cold. You're like, okay, it's cold. Here we go. Uh, but you don't have that option to like layer down uh, in the right. heat. So it's a tough one. Well, you know, I, I personally, I like the variety. Uh, there's nothing better than working outside, framing a house in the fall in in, yeah. in Canada in that crisp air. And, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love that as well. Yeah, sometime around Thanksgiving, right before the frost oh, comes. Beautiful. When the That's when awesome, the leaves right? are down, you can walk through the forest, see where you're going. It's great. Yeah. Um, so uh, before we wrap up the podcast, we always uh, like to ask a, a couple fun questions. So, all right. First of all, um, do you have a favorite piece of heavy equipment? Oh, if I had to pick one, that that'd be tough to pick one. <laughs> yeah, if I had to, I would I would have to pick an excavator with a blade. Yeah. It's pretty. I mean, you can do anything—a landscaping bucket and a blade. You can you can do pretty much anything, you know, depending on the soil. Um, yeah, yeah, it'd be hard to pick one though. That'd be like For punishment. Sure. Just pick one, and that's the <laughs> last one you can play with. Yeah, I think a big uh, a big uh, bucket would be the way to go. Yeah, maybe with a knuckle boom. That oh, yeah, pretty awesome. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now so you're just teasing me. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, so. Uh, we saw you're a pretty good singer, um, oh, and gosh. you know that you do a lot of karaoke. Where uh, did you, you see any... that? <laughs> I, somebody told me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I do you have any uh, go-to songs? Oh, geez. You know, I, it, usually if there's karaoke and there's there's been enough beverages involved to 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 get <laughs> me up on stage, uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be like Willie Nelson, you know, Zach Brown. Um, okay. Ian Brody, you know, something like that. It's going to, it's going to be, it's going to be in the country gym for sure. Nice. Uh, <clears throat> Whitney Houston, you never know. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to land on, uh, what's the song I love? Uh, knee deep with, uh, Jimmy Buffett. Oh yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe that little Jimmy, yeah. yeah, Jimmy yeah. Buffett. <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, uh, one more question here. Uh, can you play instruments while you sing? I'm pretty sure that we saw that you, you play the flute. Yeah, that's a tough one to sing while you're playing <laughs> yeah. the flute. And I'll be honest, I haven't I haven't picked the old flute up in a number of years, but uh, I did in high school get to grade 10 conservatory in the flute. Um, wow. And the reason was once you learn to play that, any wind instrument is, is almost the same uh, fingering. And there was, a, there was a, another great reason for that. You know, during our uh, band competitions in high school, all the guys playing the trumpets and all the guys playing the drums and all the guys playing guitar, they'd all go off in a room with all the other schools and, and play instruments together. And, and they would yeah. say, okay, all the ladies and Brian, <laughs> take your flutes and head over to that yeah. room. So there was strategy involved. <laughs> <laughs> you had it all figured out. <laughs> had it all figured out. Uh, um, and then uh, <laughs> it looks like you've been flying for quite a, a while now. Um, what do you love most about flying? Yeah, I, I did my, I mean, I've been flying all my life. Uh, my dad said his, his company at the airport, friends and what have you. Um, but I, I decided uh, about two and a half years ago to work on my own private pilot's license. And two years ago, almost almost to the day, two years ago in March, I, I took my first solo flight uh, where, you know, you get off the wow. runway and you, you do three circuits and landings and got off the runway. I think anyone that's ever flown has had that, that moment where you look over and you realize your instructor's not beside you and nobody's in the back mm-hmm. seat. And um, yeah, it's, it's been pretty amazing. And, and flying for me, it, it's, it's therapeutic almost, you know, you get up in the sky, get some nice music on. It's, it's, it's incredible. I've got um, just over 300 hours now, uh, but wow. it, it incorporates all the things I love. You know, I've got ants in my pants. I love to travel. Uh, I love to see things. I'm, I'm always a guy taking the scenic route. Uh, so, you know, I've got my little 172 named Cinderella here and, uh, it incorporates love of machinery. It incorporates a lot of math, believe it or not. Um, yep. and just, just getting out there and, and kind of taking the scenic route. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really fun hobby for me. That's awesome, Brian. Thanks so much for joining us. This has been awesome. Uh, you know, hearing a little bit more about your journey and, uh, and your passion for construction and, uh, everything else here. So yeah, thanks again. We really appreciate awesome. it. Well, thanks for having me. This is great. 
Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, um, oh, I forgot to ask. You're, where should people uh, follow you? Uh, yeah, I mean, on, I think on all those social platforms, it's just at Brian Baumler. Um, Perfect. You know, we've got our, our websites, baumler.ca and Baumler Construction and too many to list. Uh, but yeah, if you, if you Google, um, if you, I guess you throw it in the Google machine and all this, this stuff comes up. But we're on Facebook, Instagram, oh, and Twitter. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're out there. <laughs> Love it. Well, uh, yeah, best of luck. I heard uh, there's another uh, show launching tonight. So. Uh, another one, Rock. So last night we had Reno Resort with uh, Renovation Resort, uh, the show I did with Scott last summer up in Ontario. Uh, tonight is Rock the Block, which was a competition show in Colorado that Sarah and I uh, were, were um, ne- negotiated, begged, uh, tricked. I don't know what the word is, but we did it. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And that, uh, that actually airs tonight as well. And, and in April, I'm, I'm back up in Canada for the rest of the year. Uh, film a new show for HGTV Canada, which will, which would be a lot of fun. Very cool. We'll yeah. uh, we'll definitely tune in tonight. And uh, yeah, thanks again. This has been uh, really great. All right, thanks for having me.